You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We are continuing our conversation in the history of LCMS Black Ministry today. We'll continue that conversation in just a moment. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting the Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Joining us today, Ms. Nikki Rochester. Nikki, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thanks for having me. Also joining us today, the Reverend Donald Anthony, pastor at Grace Lutheran Church in Concord, North Carolina, and Crown and Glory Lutheran Church in Salisbury, North Carolina. Pastor Anthony, thanks for being our guest. You're welcome, and I'm delighted and thankful to be a part of this. I am interested in hearing your stories of how your family first became involved in LCMS Black Ministry. Nikki, can we start with your story? Where does your family begin its connection to or its involvement in LCMS Black Ministry? Well, I grew up in a small black congregation. We're about 60 people. We had a black pastor, all black congregation, and it was like family. You know, you were used to all the men were your fathers, all the women were your mothers. You had to do what everybody said. And that's what church was to me. When I was a teenager, almost in high school, our pastor died. And for the first time, we had a white pastor our congregation merged with another congregation and it was like 400 people in this congregation. They didn't even know each other, much less us. And it didn't seem like church to me. But the one thing that I, you know, was aware of that at every time we went to anything, I went to Walter League and anytime we went to something outside of our congregation, it was almost always all white. You know, no, you didn't see black folks around. And so it was almost like two different worlds, you know, our church and and then. But I guess I kind of formally got involved when our district, we're in, both in the Southeastern District, started what they called the inverted pyramid. And they sent representatives. You had to be elected in your own circuit to go serve in a district department. And I was one of those that was elected to serve in this district department. And I wrote down to this was being held in Emporia, Virginia. It was a good four or five hour ride. I rode down with three white pastors from our our area and got to the meeting. And again, whenever you're in, in, in anything Lutheran, it was always pretty much all white. And I was going to have a roommate you know, at this gathering. And so I was sitting there in my room waiting and this black woman walked into the, into my room and she looked at me and she said, I am so glad to see your black face. (laughs) And so it just sort of, um, I still remember that it was just so funny to me that there was still that, that same kind of, uh, you know, reference that there's so few of us. She told me, at that, at that gathering about something that I did not know about in our district called the Coalition of Black Lutheran Laity and Clergy. And she said, you, you just need to come to this meeting. You know, we meet three times a year and we kind of share some of the, the challenges and, and issues and frustrations of, of being in a predominantly white church as a, as a black congregation and you know, sometimes seeing that some of your needs or, or issues just weren't being recognized or addressed. And I started going to those meetings. That was in 1975 and been in it ever since. Tell us more about how those meetings progress. Some of the things that you talked about that you learned through those meetings and that, that uh, community that you had formed there in those meetings. Well, that was called that coalition. There were in our district about 16 Black congregations, again, didn't even know before that, that there were other predominantly, well, pretty much all Black congregations. And we met at at every meeting. It was three times a year. We met, we shared problems. We had workshops about how to address financial problems, whatnot. And one of the things that I learned at those meetings was that Black pastors were not being paid on the same level as some of their white counterparts. And that was one of the first undertakings that the coalition undertook was, you know, advocating for for pastors. I I learned at that meeting that there was a pastor in our district 
who was getting ready to retire, but he was earning this. Admittedly, this was 1975 or 76, but he was making $320 a month. And, and so we just kind of lifted that up and that, that way from our one group um, started some, some action across other districts and, and, and eventually more district units, and we started to call them district units, began to form in other districts all over the Senate. What would you say are some of the most valuable things that you've learned or experiences you've gained from your involvement with the coalition? I think one of the things that we learned in that was that the challenge is not to be quiet or, or just fuss with each other about your problems our responsibility as believers was to speak the truth in love, not in hostility, but in love, to speak the truth and and to kind of stand up for what was wrong. Many times our habit, and and again, in the society that we live in, you were supposed to keep quiet and, and not make a fuss, so to speak. And especially as a Christian, you know, you don't upset any apple carts or, and you certainly don't make white folks mad. And that's one of the things that I think we learned in the coalition and, and in coming together, that our responsibility is to speak the truth, but to do it in love. And, and that, was, that was just a, a real strong point in the game that I think became a basis for all that we did in Black ministry initially. And that became a, a, a source of contention and sometimes controversy in white and Black communities uh, congregations. Initially, the coalition was Black only. And this was especially upset, uh, upsetting for some pastors who were white pastors in a, over a Black congregation. Ironically, there was one white pastor and he came to those meetings faithfully. <laughs> and, you know, it, that was his congregation. He wanted to, to be involved. And we never, you know, we never uh, said you can't come But we just kind of uh, admired his boldness. And he, you know, he just kind of participated in that. But after our first 10 years, for 10 years, it was sort of black only. But after the first 10 years, we got to that point where we said, you know, we're we're strong enough. We're yeah, just strong enough to be able to share. We don't have to, you know, mince our words or, or thoughts. And so we opened the coalition to anybody who recognized the need to, to address these kind of concerns. So we changed the name from the Coalition of Black Lutheran Laity and Clergy to the Coalition of Lutherans in Black Ministry. And, and that organization is still very, very active today. You mentioned earlier being a, a part of a congregation that merged. Tell me more about what it was like to be a part of that and, and maybe some valuable things learned from being a part of, a, of congregations that merged. My, my feeling was that it wasn't a, more, a merger. It was an absorption. It, it's sort of like our congregation just lost all of its identity and we just did everything the way that they did it. And it just wasn't, uh, it was not a positive experience for me. And maybe that was because I was younger or, or you know, I was in, in college at that time. And, and that's when the Black Power movement and all that stuff was coming across. And so I, it, it got to be very uncomfortable for me. And I, I actually ended up drifting away from church altogether for a couple of years. And at some point, I sort of missed it. You know, it's sort of like I used to do something on Sunday mornings. What was that? And I, I got back into church. But I ironically, our congregation, when we were teenagers, we sang at a, a church in East Baltimore. And I grew up in West Baltimore, but I remember our singing at a church in West Baltimore, in East Baltimore. And it turned out, you know, now that I had moved away from home and had my own house, I lived right around the corner from that church. And that church turned out to be Berea. And I went back to, to Lutheran Church and been at Berea ever since. What are some of the things that you've learned over the years, some of the important parts of the ministry that the Coalition of Lutherans and Black Ministry has focused on in the last 25 years? A great deal on recruitment, recognizing that uh, the number of, of pastors 
I mean, all across the board, the number of pastors was was kind of declining and certainly the number of black pastors. So we put a place to a strong emphasis on recruitment. We placed a strong emphasis on lay leadership. You know, don't just we, we dealt with a lot of issues of pastoral vacancies within the coalition congregation and that whole uh I don't know whether it's a mindset or a tradition that when you don't have a pastor, you just sort of wait until a pastor comes and tells you what to do. And uh, that was one of the things that we kind of emphasized is that the pastor's job is to equip us to do ministry and that the, you know, the greatest accolade that you could give to any pastor if he's leaving is to get up and do what he taught you to do. So we place a strong emphasis on lay leadership. We are going to learn more about uh, Pastor Anthony's story in just a moment here on The Coffee Hour. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Eddie Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live Uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Our guest today, Miss Nikki Rochester and Pastor Donald Anthony, learning about their stories and their involvement in LCMS Black Ministry, taking a look at uh, some of the, the significant events that have happened in the last 25 years or so of LCMS Black Ministry. Pastor Anthony, tell us a little bit about your family story. When did you, when did your family first become involved in LCMS Black Ministry? Well, I, I grew up in Kannapolis, North Carolina, in a, a black, so Lutheran Church there, my great grandmother was one of the founding members of that congregation. And I think that one of the one of the things that drew our family and, and I think many black families into the Lutheran Church was the, the emphasis on education and schools. And so we had a, a school at Mount Calvary. As a matter of fact, I went to kindergarten at that school. I quit halfway through because I didn't like it. I didn't like taking naps. But anyway, our family has been part of the Lutheran Church for the last three gener- three generations. I guess I'm a fourth generation Lutheran. And then uh, I don't have any, I didn't have any family members who were Lutheran pastors. Uh, but when I was in high school or junior high school, I was, of course, throughout uh, my growing up years, confirmation, acolyting singing on the youth choir, being part of the youth group, you know, that's what we did because that was just part of our tradition, the church. We, we lived not far from the church, so I could walk to church if my parents weren't going. So that was just part of my social life as well. And I just became more involved. And at, uh, at some point, somebody in, in my church said to me, you ought to consider becoming a pastor. And I thought, no, I don't think I want to become a pastor. And I, I grew up in a small town. We had a lot of cars. There was a doctor's office that had a lot of antique cars. And I, I used to watch that. And I thought, if I become a doctor and I like people and I like helping people, if I become a doctor, maybe I can have as many antique cars as that doctor has. And so, of course, that was all the wrong reasons. But when when I started thinking about it, and um, I actually started praying about whether or not becoming a pastor would be something that I would do. And I felt, I really felt called by God to to go into the ministry. And so, I applied to some colleges, and one of them was Lenore Ryan College at that time in Hickory, North Carolina. It was an LCA college, and I went there. I had a really good experience there. Met two other Black Lutherans, which was rare because there, you know, there weren't uh, many Black Lutherans. I mean, my friends at church were were Lutheran, but all of my other friends at school were not Lutheran at all. But uh, I still felt the, the call of of ministry in my life and continued to pray about it. And I applied to seminary and got accepted at both of the seminaries, Fort Wayne and St. Louis. St. Louis required Hebrew. Uh, Fort Wayne did not. And I had taken some Hebrew in college and I thought, this was my thinking back then, that uh, I would go to St. Louis because it required both languages. And I, and I felt like that would be beneficial to me. I also felt like I'm already somewhat 
behind eight ball, so like different because I'm black and Lutheran, so I wanted to get as much as much as I could in terms of education to be qualified to serve as a Lutheran pastor. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how I got involved um, in in ministry. And then when when I was in high school, the Coalition of Lutherans and Black Ministry that Mr. Rochester mentioned, we also had a task force for Black ministry in our district, and they were really active in terms of promoting, as Ms. Rochester mentioned before, recruitment and church workers. And so I think they identified people who were working in the church or, or going in, into professional church work and, and kind of pulled us in under their wings and helped guide us and helped to get us involved. So that's really how I got more involved in, in the Coalition of Lutherans and Black Ministry. We had a, a forum for clergy and Black ministry that met, I think it met twice a year. That was in the Southeastern District. So in addition to having the Coalition of Lutherans and Black Ministry, we had a forum just for clergy, and it was black and white clergy, but clergy that were in congregations that were heavily involved in black ministry. And so I was a part of, of the, my, my entire ministry has been in the southeastern district. So when I my first call was to, to I was a missionary at large for the southeastern district. And, and the charge was Baltimore and Richmond, Virginia. So I spent maybe four months. I, we lived in Baltimore. I was married then. And I commuted to Richmond, would stay there during the week and come home on the weekends and did some, you know, some groundwork on the, the congregations in black ministry in, in Richmond. And then I spent the same amount of time in Baltimore looking at the congregations in black ministry in Baltimore. And the, the task was to determine which would be the best site to start a new ministry. And so by the time we finished doing the work that we were doing in Baltimore, it didn't seem that there was a real need to start a new ministry, but we had some ministries that could be revitalized. And so the district agreed, the congregation agreed. So the congregation was Berea agreed that we would work together to strengthen that ministry. And so I was there for almost 10 years. It was more than nine years, but not quite 10 and had I mean, I, I think, you know, I would say we had a good ministry there growing. We grew into the neighborhood. We, we, I, I still have contacts with some people in the neighborhood, uh, but that's kind of how I got there. Mm-hmm. You've mentioned so many different, or both of you have mentioned different organizations. Tell, tell me more, Pastor Anthony, about the importance of that community and the networking to bring people together and to build up the church for you and your ministry and the people that you were working with. I, I think the, 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 the networking and the um, camaraderie that we were able to establish, like as I think about the Forum for Clergy and Black Ministry, we, all, we of course, we, we had our pastor's conferences for the whole district, and, and that was always meaningful and, and helpful. But there were some unique challenges. There were some specific concerns that that we shared as as pastors that were involved in black ministry. And so we could we we had the opportunity to to sit together to talk about those concerns, to to brainstorm, you know, specifically, you know, how do we evangelize, how do we share the our story, how do we motivate or help train, you know, maybe there are different training training tools that we could put together. And we did some of that as well. We even were able to encourage some Bible studies to be written. Ms. Rochester, for instance, has written some Bible studies that have been published by CPH as well, that we feel like reflect our culture more and it's more relatable. One of the other things that grew out of our coming together was the establishment of a committee or, or a group that was uh, jointly supported by the Lutheran Church of Missouri Senate and at that time, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. And we published a hymn book, This Far By Faith. And one of the things that happened, you know, in the last 30 years at least, is that we were able in our congregations to, I believe, do what Luther did. When Luther worked in Germany, he took the, the songs, the tunes from the bars, and he wrote songs that was reflective of that culture. And, and that's great for that culture. Well, can we do some of that same things for our own culture? And that was one of the goals that we had when we worked on the hymn book, This Far About Faith. And we did, well, actually, Dr. Richard Dickinson did write one or two hymns that's in that, in that hymn book. And in addition to that, though, we wanted to be able to bring some, some music that, that was more reflective of our culture. And we even did 
were able to put together some liturgies that have more of a jazz kind of swing to them. Dr. Frazier Odom was, help, was very helpful in, in helping put that together as well. And, and that, even though that hymn book now is, it was 1997 that it was published, we still use it. And, and some of the liturgies during the pandemic, for instance, we had to, you know, everybody had to adjust during the pandemic. And so we adjusted our liturgy so that we could broadcast within a, you know, a reasonable amount of time. And for us, it was, it was, it was convenient to be able to use some of the liturgies out of this part of our faith. It was more, it was comfortable to us. We had learned some of those liturgies and it was inclusive. So we use that. And so, so that coming together, those groups that were able to meet together, the pastors groups, the, the coalitions, or as we call them now, the district unit, we were able to pool resources and share resources that we found were helpful in our worship, in our Bible study, and even in our preaching. Pastor Anthony, uh, can you highlight for us what you see as some of the key developments in Black ministry in the last two or three decades? I, as Ms. Rochester mentioned earlier, I think the whole emphasis on recruitment and, and again, that grew out of that the Commission on Black Ministry that developed later on into the Boy for Black Ministry Services. And I think the creation of the Boy for Black Ministry Services and the executives that went around that, that was very helpful um, for our congregations. Out of that, we were able to develop convocations. Convocations began, convocations were gatherings of of, we called them Black Ministry Family Convocations. And it really was like the family reunion of the Lutheran Church, the Black Lutheran Church in particular, coming together. And we looked forward to, I think the first one was in 1978. And then they met yearly for a while, and then every other year, and then every three years. And by the time we started meeting every three years, there was, you know, there were a couple of things going on. One, there was it was the cost because part of the cost was borne by the synod, and then part of the cost, you know, we was in the registrations that we paid. And as you know, funds were less and less available. We started meeting every three years, but what we did on the, the third year, we would meet at the we would we would begin the we would end the convocation when the synodical convention began, so that the people who were able to stay a little bit longer. Uh, on the last day of the Black Ministry Family Convocation, could go to the opening service of the Synodical Convention, and we wanted we wanted there were two things in that we wanted people to experience the convention, but we also wanted the convention to experience us. We wanted them to see that there was a significant amount of African Americans in the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate, and we too are part of the Senate. So those Black Ministry Family Convocations that was created within the last twenty five. 25 years, I think, was very significant. There is an organization called Rebecca's Garden of Hope. Rebecca's Gardens of Hope was started by the daughters of an educator and a Black pastor, Bill Parson. William Parson was his name, and his wife's name was Becky, and so Rebecca Parson. She was an educator, and, and Bill was an educator as well. Anytime he preached, he was teaching. Anytime he was in Bible study, he was teaching. But they wanted to create something in their memory that would also enable congregations to have after-school programs, mentoring programs, and tutoring programs. And Rebecca's Gardens of Hope is a, now is a recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. We have to you know, work on making sure people are aware of the resources that they provide, but, but they, it is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an awesome network that enables people to well. Um, identify volunteers that are in their communities. There are funding that are available. There is coaching on how to teach confirmation class, how to actually set up an after-school program for your, for your community. So that's, I think that's very significant as well. We have noticed, at least I've noticed, that in our publications, one of our concerns was, you know, our bulletin back when bulletins that are pre-printed, when they come out, do they reflect uh, a variety of cultures? And, and that's happening so I think we still got a ways to go on that, but I have noticed with the information that comes out for our synodical youth events, that that is much more reflective of, of multicultural. And I think that's very significant as well. 
I, w- I would just add one more thing, thing as, I, as I think about some things that have happened that's significant, and that's the scholarships, that there have been a number of scholarships that have been created that specifically are geared towards African-Americans in particular. I remember when I was in seminary, and of course that's been 30 plus years ago, there weren't many scholarships that were available for African-Americans, and there are now. There, there are several that are, are, are geared toward African-Americans. And so that's part of that recruitment effort also grew scholarships throughout that. With just a minute left, any other highlights, significant developments that, that to celebrate that from the last 20, 25 years or so? I would, we have stuff for celebration, but we still have major challenges that we that we're still dealing with. Very recently, we, we established a black ministry think tank, which was sort of born out of the closing of Concordia College Selma. That was, you know, kind of really a blow for us. But we kind of looked at that like, how did we let this happen? You know, in terms of, of leader, our leadership, how did we let that happen? And so that black ministry think tank has been meeting now for almost on a monthly basis uh, leaders in, in various aspects of, of black ministry. And we, we strategize and share information with one another. And right now we're kind of dealing with this, using the lowercase b when referring to black people. And, and we've been kind of saying this is a, a proper noun in that sense. Our thought was, why don't we be leaders in the church rather than following? And so we're, we're still speaking the truth in love about that and still trying to advocate for for change. We're also kind of addressing and, and having some good dialogue about the LCMS directory. It, it has subfilters for different ethnic groups, sometimes based on language, sometimes based on culture. But we're, we're kind of asking that African, Black and African-American congregations be listed in that. And there's always that concern that, oh, it's going to make it seem like you know, you're, you're segregating again, but no, it's, it's something that we want people to be able to experience sometime. If you've never been to a, a congregation in black ministry, you know, you might want, you're out of town, you want to try it out, come and, come and uh, join us. So we're still working on those kinds of things, but it's a fulfilling, I shouldn't say battle, but, but a fulfilling struggle. Anything else as we wrap up our time together today? I would just say that we are celebrating and thankful for the number of African-Americans that are in leadership roles within the church body of vice president. We have the first um, district president now. We've had several individuals who have served as vice presidents as well. And uh, we're also thankful for the Black Clergy Caucus that is also embracing communications and ministry focus and ownership, recruitment and revitalization and have some efforts that are going really strong in order to help us continue to grow together. Our guest today, Ms. Nikki Rochester. Nikki, thank you so much for being our guest today. Pleasure to be here. And the Reverend Donald Anthony, thank you so much for being our guest on The Coffee Hour. You're welcome. I've enjoyed this time. Thank you so much. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to KFUO.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to KFUO.org slash store.